were blessed by the Father's Day service last week. Wasn't that powerful, huh? Yes. If you have not heard that sermon, you need to hear that sermon. It was pretty powerful. Some of you men that came up here to the front, you took a stand. Uh, not only for salvation, but to say, you know what I want to do? I want to do it right. So what we're doing is when we come back from the Sabbath is that I will return. We will return to the Sabbath and I will take the men into a mentorship course, more like a discipleship course. We will do this during the midweek service and where my wife will be taking the ladies, I'll be taking the men, Pastor Lewis will be taking the youth. And we're going to be just really pouring into the women and to the men of this church to kind of show you exactly what God is asking from us. Amen? So again, be, be ready to look, look forward to that. That's going to be something that's very, very powerful. All right. If you missed part one and part two, like I said, you can listen to it online or on YouTube. It's on there as well. Uh, you can follow us on the Bible app right now. I'm going to go ahead and read out of James already. It is on your Bible app, on the U version. James 1, 13 and 15. Bless you. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Verse 14. But each person, somebody say each person, each person. is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Verse 15. Then, somebody say then. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Yikes. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're doing in this place. We thank you for what you've done from January to this point, Lord. We know we are two services away today and next week before we rest. But today we ask you to speak and continue to pour into our lives. We know, Father God, that church is just church unless we begin to apply and live what you teach us today. And so I ask you, Holy Spirit, to take control over this service and just flow through me the way you gave me this verse and this version and this sermon, Father God. So I just thank you for today. Thank you for our children and thank you for all those that are present today, Father God. In Jesus' name we lift you up. And somebody say, Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, His grace. <laughs> you may be seated.
you're battling a temptation and, 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 you're, and, and you're calling it a test and you have not found the rest that God wants you to have. You haven't been able to rest in Him. You haven't been able to rest through Him. You haven't been able to rest with Him. Because you keep confusing a temptation for a test. So let's go ahead and break it down. If the scripture tells me in verse 13 that God cannot tempt me, it says that God is we say God is tempting me, but it says, but God cannot be tempted by evil. It, it, it's just white or black. It, it's not in between, guys. God won't tempt you. Let me just clarify. He will not tempt you. He will test you, but he will not tempt you. Well, Pastor, what is the difference? Well, the difference is, like I said, God. Uh, uh, tests come from God. Temptation comes from the devil. Test, when he, he puts a test in front of us, it's to increase our faith, our wisdom, and our trust in him. But when Satan puts temptation, it's not to increase our faith. It's totally the opposite. It's to decrease our faith, to, to be filled with sin, and not only that, to later then have that feeling of guilt. God will not take you into a place so you can fall. And then you can cry to your God, what happened? No, that, that's not the God that we serve. The scripture clearly says it for it, uh, clearly here. But if you read it, read it carefully in verse 14, it says, each person is tempted. Watch what it says here. Each person is tempted when they are what? Dragged away by what? By their who? I want you to say mine. My evil desire. Now, you, you may not understand this church, or you may not want to, you might not, might not want to realize it, but everybody here has temptation. I'm going to say that again and I want more amens. Everybody here has temptations. Amen. The difference is that yours may look terrible. Yours may look sinful and ugly and uh, what do you call it? Unwanted by society. And others may be like, oh, well, my, my temptation, it, it, it's really not so much. It really doesn't hurt. I mean, temptation is like sin. It's sin and temptation. It's a sin. It's, a it's the same thing. It's the same thing. And so we struggle with this stuff. And the Bible says here, each person is tempted by when they are dragged away by their own evil desire. What happens is that we allow a door is open, we walk in it, and we walk in it because it says of our own evil desire, uh, it's enticed. Meaning, uh, I'll give you a perfect example. I am not, uh, I don't drink by any means. Uh, I just choose not to drink. I, I really never drank in my life. I don't drink. So if I walked into a bar, I would not be tempted. It, it, it's, it's really that simple, church. Uh, I can go in there and I can have 400 people around there offer me something to drink, a beer, and I wouldn't take it. It's not because I'm like, oh, this is so hard. No. It doesn't entice me. But if we walked into a fruit stand and they sold my bananas, I'd be all over it. <laughs> Just trying to make a point here. You offer me a mango night, I'm not going to say no. I'm going to have diarrhea for a week, but I'm going to love it. <laughs> All right. Some of you are visualizing that. Get it out of your picture. Get it out of your picture. Get it out of your picture. Get it out of your head. All right. So, so, so what I want you to understand is, church, when we fall into temptation, I'm not even in the story yet, but when we fall into temptation, it's because of our own desire. Scripture says it. You see, a lot of us think, for example, I'll, I'll give you this example I've said it before. When we talk about a drug addict, a drug addict doesn't say, I'm going to start at the top with PCP, LSD, and meth. No. They don't. They open a door because of some weakness. Maybe they had a fight. Maybe they're going through depression. Maybe they started drinking. Maybe they started with weed. I don't know. You open the door. Your own self-desire. You jump in, and all of a sudden, you begin to develop a craving. And next thing you go, you go from smoking once a week to twice a week. Next thing you know, you're smoking weed and you're adding this to it. Well, let me pop a pill of ecstasy with that. Well, you know what? That's not doing anything more. Let me start with crack and let me go on. Okay, and you keep going. No one ever says, wake up, oh man, I just want to be a drug addict today. And I'm just going to go straight to the top of the piece of it. You don't do that. You don't do that. But what happens is when we leave a door open and never allow God to shut it, we'll always... Trapped into that temptation. It's not a test. It's a temptation. Why is it a temptation? Because it's a desire that you want. It's just like somebody after they eat and they say, oh, I want something sweet. Temptation. <laughs> they put a chocolate molten in front of you from Chili's. Oh, Jesus, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, but I'll start my diet on Monday. And everybody always starts it on Monday. They only last till Tuesday. 
Are you with me, church? An alcoholic doesn't start with a bottle of tequila. He doesn't go to the night booking and say, I gotta have me some alcohol. No. It started when they offered him a beer, takes a beer, all of a sudden, you know what, let me try a wine cooler. Next thing you know, you're going from here to there. And now all of a sudden, you just need more to get what you've been trying to get. Yeah. Temptation. Temptation. Oh, Pastor, so you're saying that drinking is bad. There was a perfect question, and I was going to hit this in the top of the series, but I might as well hit it now. The question is, the question is, can Christians drink? People are saying, Pastor, is it true that can, 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 can a Christian drink? No. The question is not, can a Christian drink? The question is, should a Christian drink? When you ask yourself that question, and if you have self-discipline and self-control, then you can answer your own question. But when you know that it leads, conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sinful growth will give it to you. I'm telling you, I've seen people say, God, I was so drunk, I don't know what I did. Man, I just started with one or two. Next thing you know, I was doing five or six. And then this girl ended up in my bed. I don't know how she got there. Wow. It, it, it's the same thing with, 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 with affairs. Just thought, I told you this. They don't start in the bedroom. They start with the phone book. Yep. It grows up and it grows and it grows. And I just need to feel. I, need, I like that temptation. I like to be needed. I like to be wanted. So let me see who likes me. Let me see who would like me a comment that I like on Facebook. Let me see. And you begin to add and you feed it. Then there's a private message. And then, hey, I didn't know you were going to be, I didn't know you were going to be here at the restaurant. Of course you did. You've been stopping him on Facebook all year long. You just checked in 10 minutes ago. No, he's there. It must be the Lord that I the Lord is not the Lord. Can I preach or not? It's not. It's not. Affairs don't just happen. You don't just slip into a vagina. You don't. Yes, I just said that. I'm nervous. I can say these things. No, it doesn't happen, church. We are tempted. We are weak. We are, are weak. And so we seek a desire. Fall and then feel like crap. And then blame God. Uh-uh. Nonsense. Don't do it. Don't do it, church. A gambler. Oh, I got real quiet. Real quick. <laughs> a gambler doesn't start with $10,000 at Vegas. I want to put $1,000 in. No. Starts here, little scratch off. Then you get the itch, more scratch off. Goes on and on and on. Next thing you know, you're at a dollar. The quarter machines don't work anymore. Let's go to a dollar. Let's go. To hey, you know what? I got fifty bucks. Let's do fifty. Next thing you go, and then it's grown and it's grown. You don't realize it. It never starts there. It starts here. We give birth to it. And here's the problem with us Christians. And I want to say as Christians, because I can talk about people from outside. But here's the problem with us: we love to feed our sin. Ah, just a little bit more. Anyway, ah, it's okay. Ah, you know, no one's going to attack. I'm okay. And then something happens. It hits the fan and then what? So that's the whole point of today. The whole point of today is that I want you to be able to rest. We're going into the Sabbath. And it's like I told the leaders, 48 of them this morning or whatever it was, 130 total, whatever, I don't want to come back home and have 20 left because half of them vaccinated. you got to keep your guard up at all times because even though we're resting, Satan does not rest. So are you ready? That was a long intro. No. But this will be short. 2 Corinthians 12, 1. You've heard the story before. This is Paul talking. I must go on boasting, he says. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. Verse 2. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or whether it was in the body or was out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Verse 3. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows. And then verse 4 says, was caught up to, uh, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. What are you saying, Pastor? What, what, did this, what did all this verse say? This is Paul talking. He is boasting, and he's saying uh, he has a gift. Understand who Paul was. Paul has a gift of revelation. He has gift of the Word. He has gift of the Holy Spirit. He has gift of Jesus, even though he's never met him. He has this revelation, and he begins to say, I know a man in Christ. And he starts telling you what the revelation is. Now again, he never worked with Jesus. 
Now we know that he spent three years in Arabia. The Bible tells me in Galatians 1 through 11, it tells me that he received the gospel from the Lord. So Paul was so connected to God that God would clearly, and uh, what would be the word, uh, individually personalized, talk to Paul in a way that other people could not understand. He gave Paul a revelation of the word of scripture. Uh, he even goes on to tell me, it's like this verse, he, he look at what it says in verse 4. He was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one, no, things that no one else is permitted to tell. What he's saying is, I know things. Paul says, God has shared things with me. I've seen things. I, I, I've heard things. I have visions of things. I've seen so many things and I can't even tell you. Not because he didn't want to share, but because he had that communication and that contact and that relationship with God that God told him, you're not allowed to say a word. Can you imagine if you had that kind of relationship where God will tell you secrets that he would share with you something so powerful that you understood and you got, but then he told you, but said, I'm telling you because I trust you that you would not say anything. Can you imagine if you, if you had that relationship with God? What would it do? What would it do? Think about it. Let's be human. What would it do? It would make you boastful. It would make you conceited. It would make you prideful. Because God is talking to me, he's not talking to you. Or because God talks to me in a way that he doesn't talk to you. Or because your revelation may be here, but my level of revelation is here. I'm trying to paint a picture here. This is exactly... What's going on with Paul? This is the, the, the Bible tells me in 1 Corinthians that Paul recounted all the Lord's post-resurrection appearances. If you read the story in 1 Corinthians 53, he says, I knew exactly what happened during the resurrection, even when he wasn't even there. Somebody say, wow. This was Paul. He never saw Jesus hang on the cross. Why? Because at the time, Paul was Saul. Remember that. He was Saul. He was a Christian persecutor. He was a Christian killer. He couldn't stand Christians. Pastor, where are you going? to stay with me. It's going to get good here in a minute. And so now all of a sudden God changes him. He goes from Saul to Paul and he gets this great, grand revelation. So can you imagine how he saw himself? How he must have felt? He must have felt proud. He must have been arrogant. And that's why he goes on to say in verse 5, watch I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Verse 6, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. Notice what he said. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Watch what it says in verse 6. If you didn't catch it, read it again. If I choose to boast, basically he's saying, I could if I want to. I really could if I want to, he says, because I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. I don't care how you see it. I don't care what you would think about it. If I'm saying what I'm saying and I'm telling you what I saw, you might think I look like a fool, but I'm not a fool because I'm telling you the truth. This is Paul. Watch what he goes on to say in verse 7. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore, watch, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to what? To torment me. Now we've got to digest what just happened. He's telling these people, he's talking to them, he's saying, man, I just want to boast about my weaknesses. I don't want to boast about my strength. I don't even want to go there. I don't want to talk about anything else. What I know is great. But then he goes on to say, these surpassingly great revelations in verse 7, he says, in order to keep me from becoming proud, from becoming arrogant, from becoming conceited. Church, I'm talking to you right now. You may not even hear. From becoming arrogant, conceited, and proud, he said, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger of, I want you to say that out loud, a messenger of, to torment me. He knew what he knew. He knew he was human. He was a leader. It would be that quick to be conceited. It would be that quick to be proud. And so the Bible says that a messenger from Satan sent him 
a thorn in the flesh. Now, let me just recap that for a minute because some have preached that that thorn in the flesh is a physical ailment. It's a disease. It's a disorder. Church, let me tell you right now that he was not sick. It was not an ailment. It was not a disease. It was not a disorder. It was not a sickness. Pastor, how do you know that? Because when you study the life of Paul, you know in Philippians 1, if you read chapter 1 and all the way to 22, you will read that he always prayed to go with the Lord. He said, Lord, take me with you. Take me with you already. I am done. Take me with you. And when the time came in verse 22, and God says, are you ready to come with me? He says, no, I will stay, and I'll stay for the church." The church was so messed up back then that he said, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. I will sacrifice myself and keep preaching the word even though I'm being persecuted day and night. He could have gone. He lived a long life. He wasn't sick, church. This spirit that we're talking about is that. A spirit. Not an ailment. Not a disease. I want you to understand one thing. He was not possessed. Don't confuse the two. He was being tormented, but he was not possessed. He was in his right man. And someone would ask, how can a man so powerful, a man so anointed with great revelation, how can this happen to him? you got to turn it around and ask the other question. That's why it's happening to him. Because he is so great and full of power and full of anointing. For when you have power and you have anointing and you have revelation, Satan wants you dead. He wants you out of the picture. So I have news for you. If Satan isn't bugging you, there may be a problem with your anointing. There may be a problem with your spirit. Because Satan only likes to pick on those that have his power, his purpose, and his plan. Can you make true? So powerful, his anointing, and watch what it says in verse 8. You know the story. Three times. I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. How many times? Three times. But watch what he said in verse 9. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. He is begging. He is pleading. When you begin to see the other versions, he is literally crying out. He's saying, God, really? With the power and anointing that you've given me, I've raised people from the dead. I've cast out demons, but I can't get this torn out of my flesh. Ah, oh, church, you better get this. Because these sermons are not preached. These sermons are not preached. He is begging, just take this pain away. This, uh, what we would call this, oh, this nonsense, this pain in the butt. This, I can just imagine what the Spirit was constantly telling him, his temptations, telling them, hey, you're not really Paul, you're Saul. Really, you're trying to save the same people you were killing a few months ago? Really? Maybe the demon was reminding him of what he used to do. Really? I've seen who you've been with. I've seen what you've done with women. I've seen what you did in hidden closets. I've seen what you've done when no one's watching. Really? And now you call yourself a servant of God and this demon that is constantly tormenting him. Not annoying him. Tormenting him. Understand that church is a big difference. And he's pleading and he's pleading and all he's saying is that God just just, just take it away. I mean, really, with everything, just take it away. And God says, no, 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 it's my grace. My grace. My grace is sufficient for, for thee. Now, please understand what's going on here. This is like a bully. If you've ever been bullied, you know what I'm talking about. It's a constant nag. You're praying, Lord, let the train hit this guy. Just get rid of my enemy. Some of you have people at work that are constantly a thorn in your flesh. Some of you have people around in the family. Oh, you don't want to say amen because I know some are sitting next to you. <laughs> family that's just like, oh, Lord Jesus, I love him, I love her, but. Sometimes it could be your own spouse. It's a relationship. It could be something at work. It could be a, a temptation. 
something that you are battling with, a drug, pornography, gossip, cheating, gambling. Oh, why, do I have, why does this voice keep telling me to go back to it? You're not hearing me, church. You're not hearing me, church. For when, for when you are being tempted over and over and over, it's because he, the enemy knows the potential that you possibly have if you would stop going and falling over and over and over and over because he knows that when he can tempt you, he has you bound. But when you are free and you understand who you are, you become more powerful than that. And he's begging three times. I remember one of my spirits that would torment me. Have you heard this before? And I'll share it again. One of the spirits that would torment me with the spirit of jealousy. I'm talking to people here in relationships. Please listen. Jealousy is not a character. Jealousy is a spirit that is brought on from something that has happened to you in the past. So I was hurt in a previous relationship. And so when I started dating who my wife is now, I was so jealous. You couldn't see, I, I, it, it was terrible. I can tell you that 80% of the time that we would go out to eat or something, it would end up in a fight. Because who are you looking at? Why do you look at that way? Why did you look at the waiter like that? I'll place the order for you. Don't look at it, look at your menu. You laugh, but it's true. And some of you are laughing, but you're in that same boat right now. To the point that I was being bullied by this torment, it, 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 when you uh, have this temptation or when you have this ailment or this spirit tormenting you, let me tell you, you don't even live. You can't even sleep because your mind is a battlefield. And your mind, my mind was telling me, oh, what is she doing, man? Who is she with? Man, I, and you begin to think, you begin to think all this stuff. Why? Because of the prior incidents that happened in your life that you didn't let God restore. Church, I'm trying to help you here. I'm trying to help you here. So because someone has left you, because someone has hurt you, now your guard is always up. So when God wants to bless you with the right one, you cannot see it. Because you are still trapped by a spirit of torment. And so I was being bullied by the spirit of jealousy, and I was just constantly, oh, I, 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 here's the thing. I would pray, I said, Lord, I'm a preacher's kid. Like, that helps. <laughs> Lord, really? I play in the praise and worship. I serve. I clean the toilets. I run the sound. I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm a youth pastor. Why am I dealing with the spirit? Lord, take it away. And God says, no, sir. Are y'all going to hear this, church? Y'all better hear this, because this is what you all are pleading. You keep pleading for God to take something away. You keep pleading because you're tired of the pain. You're tired of the suffering. You're tired of the mental anguish. You're tired of this and that. And you're like, oh, I'm just so sick and tired of the situation. When is it going to change? Here's the sermon. It's not going to change until you change. You see, God won't take it away. Oh, God, church. Let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you. If God takes this thing away from me, then guess what? I will live in fear of it coming back. And I mean God, and, and, and He removes everything. That's not what I'm saying, but if you're crying for God to take away a certain situation, always you will never grow in your faith. What I'm trying to say is that I would say, God, why? Can, 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 let's just go out and I, I would just want to have a good time. And, I, and no, I would run into people. Why is it my flesh? Why does he have to be here? Why does he have to be here? Why does he have to be here? And I say, God, really? Why? I mean, all the restaurants, why? <laughs> Thorn in my flesh. God says, you see, I can't change that situation because I'm trying to change your heart. Because if I can't change your heart, that thing will own you the rest of your life. Church, I'm trying to teach you something here today. So what was he doing? He was actually making me stronger by leaving the floor in there. He's leaving it there so that then I can say, Lord, I am weak. I am weak, but your grace is sufficient for me. And as I notice, day in and day out, and week one, and week two, and months pass, and you think, guess what, I don't have a spirit of jealousy in my life anymore. I had to come. 
confront that without God removing it, but now I don't have to be afraid of it again because I have domain and dominion over that authority, over that spirit. God has given us authority over scorpions, over spirits. The problem is we want God to take all of that away and we never grow. So we're like Christians with little tribunas and we never grow. But God says, raise up generation. For I'm trying to tell you that all you need is my grace. My grace is sufficient for you to give it all hands up. If God takes it away back then, I would have never had control of my life. But you see, he doesn't remove it because he's trying to change your heart. Maybe your prayer should change. And we should start asking, Lord, give us the strength and endurance instead of, Lord, take it away. Paul pleaded three times. Three times he got the same answer. By grace, that's all you need. Question, could God have taken it away? But then Paul would have been bound. Paul may have become conceited. But the Christian scripture clearly says, to keep me from becoming conceited, he sent this messenger. Now please understand, Satan tempted him, not God. The scripture says, Watch what it says in verse 10. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, it's when I am strong. Church, you want to become strong? You have to endure when you're weak. And the moment you think you don't have any weaknesses, any temptations, is the moment you have to realize you have pride. Now watch what happens. For the sake of time, I'll jump over to 2 Timothy. Watch. You, however, verse 10, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, endurance. This is Paul talking. Persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. It says, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Verse 12, in fact, you better get this church, this is for you. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be. Doesn't think might be, it says will be. This is why our churches are empty today. Because we want God's blessing, but we don't want to take the persecution that comes with it. Church, the moment you said yes to the Lord and the moment you decide to take that stand and the moment you decide to do what is right, I talked about it this morning in the group, to be righteous and to live righteous brings life, brings hope, brings so many positive things. But the moment we decide to do that, man, the devil puts a whole attack on everything you have. Your finances, your marriage, your relationship, you name it. I mean, all hell breaks loose. Everything. You've heard me say this. And that's why a lot of us don't last. How was it when I was in the world? I didn't have that problem. My wife didn't mind that I was drunk or me and her would get drunk together. My wife didn't mind doing this or we could go do that. And why when I was in the world? That's why, because you were in the world. You were already his. He left you alone. You're already his. But when you said yes to him, the devil says, no, I want to take back what you took from me. And it becomes Ephesians 6.12. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual strongholds. And so we begin to fight people instead of spirits. And then comes divorce. And then comes bankruptcy. And then comes all these things, and we blame it on this, that, God. That says, man, don't, 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 don't confuse the two. The devil is so tricky. Just like I showed you that man, he's so sneaky. He'll come in where you least, I mean, he'll get you. Church, but the moment you decide... The moment you decide and the devil comes at you, it's the same moment that God's power can come over you. It's the same power that the Holy Spirit says, I'm leaving you one greater, a great counselor, an advocate, someone that will help you. But church, you cannot and you will not know if you don't plug into the Holy Spirit. Plug into the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit will help you flee temptation. It will help you resist temptation. 
It will help you overcome that situation. It will help you get over that problem. It will help you get over that jealousy, that greed, that pride, that arrogance. Why? Because I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. That's why Paul said it. He says, I, I'm weak. I'm weak here. He says, but when I have him, I can rest in him. It's his power. It's his strength. It's his ability that lets me go through what I need to go through. The question is, church, you want to live a godly life, then you will be persecuted. But let me tell you this. That's a great sign. Because when you're being any persecuted and you see all hell breaking loose, you know you're doing something. And you can say, Lord, wow, my house may look like it's falling apart, but I know you are the cornerstone. I know you are the glue. I know you're going to be the one that's going to maintain us together, keep us focused, keep us in. Like I said earlier, Saul was a Christian killer, but God transformed him. What's my point in this? Some of you are afraid to live a godly life because of the life you lived before. The ungodly life. So you say, how can I possibly change? How can I possibly be new? How can I possibly be, uh, uh, how can actually God speak to me? Or how can I be considered God? Guys, all you have to do is just accept Jesus Christ in your heart. And you say, Lord, I am a sinner. You are my Savior. And as of today, I want to live for you. And you're going to have hiccups along the way. And you're going to have trip-ups along the way. But a righteous man may fall. But seven times he will rise up. Church, it's not how many times you fall, it's how many times you get back up. Saul was the worst of the worst. He was worse than any, any all of you that are here today. But God doesn't see Saul. He sees Paul. I'm here to tell you that he doesn't see you as an addict. He doesn't see you as this, as a cheater, as a liar. He doesn't see you as a divorcee. He doesn't see you as bound to pornography. He doesn't see you like that. He says, I see them as a child of God. Tell them that all they have to do is trust in me and my grace. It's all sufficient. That's all they need. My grace will get them to the next level. My grace will get them to break through to that situation. My grace will break those chains of bondage in your life. But all they have to do is walk the godly life. Stand to your feet, church. Walk the godly life. Church, those Addictions and temptations that you face. Youth, I know that temptations must be crazy in your lives too. Adults, likewise. Everybody here, like I said, has temptations. When you learn, when you learn to literally trust Him, it, I, I'm, I'm telling you from experience, and I'm just giving you the example of jealousy. If God doesn't deliver me from jealousy, I maybe I'm in prison right now. Let me tell you, jealousy leads to anger. Anger will make you do some stupid stuff, and you know what I'm talking about. You go ask people in prison right now what they're doing there, and they say for one minute of anger, what they do. And jealousy is one of probably one of the toughest things I had to overcome. But again, it was his strength. And just enduring through it, you allow the time to happen, and God will restore you, church. There's nothing that He cannot restore. Psalms reminds me that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God will deliver me from them all. If that's you, and you're battling an affliction, you're battling a temptation, you're battling uh, whatever you've been battling, and you, you want God to take it away. Now, maybe he's trying to change you. Maybe he's trying to change your heart. I talked to a gentleman. I'll finish with this. I talked to a gentleman who said, I don't want to, I don't want to say his name because you know who he is. And he says, you know, man, I, I have this against my brother and I have this against my brother and he's the only one left the church but he doesn't want to come to church. And I said, you know what, maybe he's not coming to church because you haven't changed. Maybe you need to really forgive him so that you so that he can come in here. Never looked at it that way. But what if what if God is trying to change you and you're too busy wanting to change the situation? When God changes you and makes you strong, no devil in hell 
can hold you back, church. If this was for you, this altar is open. If this was for you, this altar is open. Some of you need to find rest. Some of you need to find rest. You're being tormented. Come on up. You've been tormented by a past issue, by a history issue. If you're here for the first time, or maybe you're not here for the first time, but you don't have Jesus in your heart, and you say, I want to be saved, would you raise your hand? I just want to see if there's anybody here that has not accepted Jesus Christ. Just wave it up high in the air. Anybody? Everybody's saved in here. Awesome. I have a lifeline there, some lifelines right there, Miss Yvette. She's going to be right there. If you have any questions, you will answer your question, but I'm going to say a prayer out loud. So if there's anybody else, congratulations, by the way. Isn't that awesome? Because we're going to thank the Lord Jesus Christ. Say this with me, and let's do it all together. Father, come into my heart. I'm a sinner, but you're my Savior. But today, I proclaim that you live, that you died on the cross for me, but you rose again on the third day. Thank you, Jesus, for taking me in. Give me strength, wisdom. Show me how to live the life you've called me to live. Holy Spirit, come into my life and guide me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you said that prayer, you are saved. You are good to go. You are free. Amen. That's awesome. Congratulations. Congratulations. If you're here, just bow your heads right there where you're at. Let's change your prayers around. Stop asking God to take it away. Start asking God to give you strength. And remember, His grace. His grace is all you need. There's no addiction that you can't overcome with His grace. There's no sin that you can't overcome with His grace. Let's come back to the heart of worship. There's so many chains that can be broken just through worship. Just begin to pray there, will you? And the music. 